February 6, 2014. Five Finnish divers decided to explore the beauty of Plura Cave, the largest water-filled natural cave in northern Europe. Half a day later, only three of them would resurface, disbelieving, distressed, and barely alive. They would leave two of their friends behind, floating dead within the depths of the cave that few others would have dared to traverse. Technical diving is quite popular in Finland, but the community for cave diving is small due to its many associated risks. Because of this, many cave divers are familiar with one another. Kai Konkanen, a 46-year-old electrical contractor, had first planned a trip to Plura Cave in January 2014, but it was postponed because many had prior commitments. He had to reschedule it to February, and by sheer luck, four other divers were free to accompany him that day. 42-year-old fireman Patrick Gronquist, 40-year-old production manager Yari Huotaranen, 33-year-old electrical designer Vesa Rontanen, and 34-year-old mechanical engineer Yari Yu, whose full name is not disclosed at the request of his family. These five men traveled 15 hours on Huotaranen's van from Finland, Sweden, pulling a trailer full of their gear, a snowmobile, underwater scooters, a few dozen large diving cylinders, and various smaller equipment. They arrived just past one in the morning on February 6 at Jordbrew Farm in Rana, a municipality in the Norwegian county of Nordland where the Plura Cave is located. In the group, Konkanen and Gronquist were the most experienced divers. It was them along with another diver, Sami Pokarinen, who had discovered the connection between the two known entrances to the Plura Cave. They were also the first to dive from one entrance to the other, thus conducting a so-called traverse, a feat that is considered a great accomplishment in the cave diving community. The five men's plan this time was to do the second traverse, the first one in this direction. They would have to dive a depth of 130 meters, making the undertaking extremely challenging. Adding to the difficulty was the cold water along with the narrow tunnel they would have to pass through. They were to descend into the cave through an entrance located in a pond, and dive 2,036 meters to the other entrance at Cave Steinmugelflaget. Situated roughly 100 meters below the surface of the earth, this cave is dry but difficult to reach. This planned dive was so difficult that perhaps no more than a dozen Finnish cave divers would have dared to undertake it. But Konkanen and his companions were up to the challenge. Unfortunately, two of them would fail and perish halfway through. Morning of February 6. The temperature was minus 3 degrees Celsius. The group had spent their night at the Jordbrew farm before waking up at 8 to make their preparations. They divided the group into two. Konkanen, Rontanen, and Yari Yu left to transport their equipment down to the Stein Nugelflaget. The five men would eat and change into dry clothes there after the dive, then climb back to the surface to return to their lodgings. Gronquist and Huotaranen were left at the Plura Pond where they were tasked with cutting a hole in the frozen surface using a chainsaw. The ice was dozens of centimeters thick, and the guide bar of the saw was barely long enough to penetrate it. But after the hole was created, a spectacular sight was revealed. Through the 150 centimeters of remarkably clear water, the bottom of the pond can be seen clearly. The rocks littering the bed were vivid as if seen through a giant magnifying glass. The two friends who have made long dives together in Finland and abroad quickly assembled their gear and suited up. As they were preparing to take off below the ice, Yari Yu and Konkanen arrived to see them off. Rontanen at the time had returned to the Jodru farm to fetch his dry suit. It was 20 minutes past noon. As Gronquist and Huotaranen proceeded towards the cave entrance, Konkanen aimed the camcorder at the hole. Pate and Yari Huotaranen about to take off towards Stein Nugelflaget. They'll rest in the water for a while. The two divers both used an underwater scooter to move faster and to conserve their strength. The dive was expected to last five hours. Strips of limestone lined the walls and ceiling of the cave. The water was minus two degrees Celsius. In such a low temperature, one must be careful not to tear their dry suits on the schists of limestone or it could be very dangerous to the diver. The first 500 meters of the cave was a gradual descent to a depth of 34 meters before ascending briefly to a 250 meter long chamber with little water. After, the cave would begin to descend steeply, first reaching a depth of 60 meters, 
then 100 meters, and finally 130 meters. Gronquist and Huotaranen had turned off their underwater scooters as they approached the deepest part of the cave. There, they saw a round plate attached to a guideline and two arrows pointing in the opposite direction. Gronquist had attached them with Konkanen and Pakaranen the previous autumn. Written on the plastic plate was the date and their initials with a waterproof marker. They followed the guideline and reached a point where the passage makes a 90 degree right while beginning to ascend. It was a narrow section. Not the narrowest on the route, but definitely the most dangerous. Not for any specific reason, but only because this is where the five men's nightmare would begin. Gronquist made it through this narrow passage first. Once he was through, he looked back and found that Huotaranen did not follow him. Worried, Gronquist quickly turned back and waited. He saw Huotaranen waving his light up and down. To divers, that was a sign of distress. Huotaranen was yelling at him to come over. Gronquist swam back until they were face to face. Huotaranen asked Gronquist to detach one of his large bailout cylinders as it was apparently in the way. Detaching it was difficult. Gronquist had to first move his scooter out of the way. While he was doing so, Huotaranen kept yelling at him to come back. He seemed to be panicking, so Gronquist told him to calm down. He then came back and moved the bailout cylinder roughly a dozen meters ahead. He had thought of pulling Huotaranen out in case he was stuck, but he was afraid it would cause panic. At that time, he had no idea how distressed his friend was. He only noticed the line of Huotaranen's scooter that was stuck under a big rock. Huotaranen tried to pull it free by force, and when it came off, Gronquist moved out of the way. But Huotaranen continued to call for Gronquist. He was shouting for the OC, the open circuit bailout gas. Gronquist knew then that the situation was serious. He handed the mouthpiece from his cylinder to Huotaranen, who took maybe 10 breaths and then switched back to the rebreather. This was repeated two or three times. Then Gronquist noticed that Huotaranen had nothing in his mouth. He tried using a diving regulator with a purge button on his friend, but it was too late. Huotaranen had inhaled water. He drowned right in front of Gronquist's eyes. Back at the pond entrance, Konkanen, Rontanen, and Yari Yu were getting ready to begin their dive. They had agreed that they would let two hours pass before following behind Gronquist and Huotaranen. This is to ensure that the sediment possibly stirred up by the two has had time to settle. While waiting, they had no idea that one of their friends was already dead. Gronquist clung on to the rock. He was breathing fast and he found it hard to pull himself together. He was a rescue diver and in the course of his career, he had seen many lifeless bodies in the water and in ambulances. But these people he didn't know, while Huotaranen was his friend. Gronquist did his best to calm down. Upon checking his dive computer, he found that before he could safely ascend to the surface, he had to stay under the minus two degrees water for over 400 minutes. Otherwise, he would suffer from fatal decompression sickness. His life was now in danger. His diving time had increased from five hours to close to nine hours. Even a minor equipment failure would probably cost him his life. He had a bailout system, but Huotaranen had the oxygen cylinder. He had also offered some of his bailout gas to Huotaranen. He was worried about his three other friends, afraid of what would happen once they found Huotaranen's body in two hours' time. But Gronquist had no choice. Staying would kill him, and so he swam towards Steinmugelflaget. As expected, the three men found Huotaranen's lifeless body on their journey two hours later. The first to find him was Rontanen. He was at the front of the group. Shortly after they descended to the deepest part of the cave and passed the round plastic plate attached to the guideline, Rontanen heard a beep. He immediately realized that something was amiss. It was the distress signal of a breathing apparatus. Then, he saw the deceased. Later, Rontanen said that he remembers seeing a light appear from behind him and shouting through his mask that Huotaranen was dead and that he would try to find a way around, but it did not look good. He began to take off his gear to try to fit through the narrow opening around Huotaranen's body. Behind him was Yari Yu. It was unknown whether he also saw Huotaranen's body and tried to turn back, but Konkanen, who was at the rear of the group and had no idea what had happened, noticed that Yari Yu was acting strange. He was swinging peculiarly, 
and switched from the closed circuit system to his bailout system. Konkanen tried to calm him down and made sure he wasn't trapped and that the bailout gas was on, but as the situation continued, he realized it couldn't be a failure in the rebreather. There was nothing Konkanen could do. Moments later, Yari Yu was dead. Konkanen then saw the body of Hua Taranen, and next to it was Rontanen who was desperately kicking his fins to get around the body. He shouted to Rontanen that Yari Yu was also dead and that they should turn back. But the way back was longer, so Rontanen dared not to turn back. Konkanen had to make up his mind then. He could see that Rontanen was breathing hard and he had concerns that the man would exhaust himself. He couldn't wait for Rontanen to find a way through. Rontanen, he thought, was unlikely to make it. He thought that Gronquist had probably died as well, so Konkanen turned back alone. It was about 3.40 p.m., February 6. Two men lost their lives in the span of less than three hours. The three others would continue to persevere, racing against time with limited oxygen and while suffering from shock and nitrogen narcosis. Racked with guilt from not being able to save their friends, the three still had to work hard to keep their own lives. Grueling hours passed. Patrick Gronquist would rise to the surface a little past 9 o'clock in the evening, followed by Vesa Rontanen, who surfaced nearly 90 minutes before it was safe. He was starting to show signs of decompression sickness. Three hours later, Kai Konkanen would emerge from the entrance of the cave to the pond. His dive had lasted 11.5 hours. The next day, news of the death of the two Finns spread on the news. The police launched an investigation and soon called upon three experienced British divers. They descended into the cave but were unable to dislodge the bodies. They deemed the operation dangerous and a diving ban was soon imposed on the cave. The remains of Yari Yu and Yari Huataranen would stay in the cave until March 26th before they were retrieved by Gronquist and Sami Pakaranen in a secret recovery operation. The following day they rang the authorities. Their operation drew a lot of media publicity. Though what they did was against official orders, their actions did not come under criticism. Two months and three weeks later, Gronquist, Konkanen, and Rontanen would load their gear into the back of a trailer. They were set to embark on a two-week diving trip to Spain where the magnificent cave Pozol Azul is located. Cave divers have explored the cave since the 1970s and discovered a passage of over nine kilometers into the depths of the mountains. No one has ventured deeper. If you have followed the story to this point, I would like to say a big thank you. If you liked this kind of story, don't forget to hit the like button and comment below. If you're interested in this type of content, please click on the subscribe button and turn on your notification bell so you will be notified when another video is posted. Until next time, be cautious and don't ever lose your sense of wonder.